an idea, a concept that I personally believe in that is a personal opinion of mine and not necessarily factual according to the Word of God, but it's something that could be true, it's something that might be true, and it's something that I like to believe in as true. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to stick my neck out, you know, and say that it is true, because the scriptures don't say so. They don't clearly indicate one way or the other. And if you know me, you know that if the Bible doesn't say so, I don't believe it. Now, I may have some opinions about things, and I've got lots of opinions, just ask me and I'll tell you my opinion. But I always preface it with saying straight up, this is not what the Bible says, this is my opinion, and it's based upon what the Bible says, but it's still an opinion, and it's not worth anything compared to the scriptures. Because the scriptures are clear about what they say, and they mean what they say. They're very obvious. It's easy to read, and even a child can understand it. Now, having already said that, I know everybody's expecting some great revelation. And the reality is, is that, in a way, for me, it is a great revelation because there's something I really do believe in. And it's based upon church history as well as a lot of other commentaries and people that have said the same thing. There is a common thought and theme that we believe that in heaven, you don't speak, you sing. In other words, everything is sung rather than spoken. There's a rhythm to everything that goes on. It's just all in rhythm and it's all in chord and it's all in song. And that may be true, because if you've never noticed that somebody has been a Christian for a long time, their words seem to flow and have a rhythm to them that seems to go along with the Word of God. Seems to have kind of a vernacular that's peculiar to their own personality, which is true, but it also seems to flow in a way that seems to always fit the Scriptures and the Word of God as God has revealed it to that person. And it just rolls off their tongue as though it were automatic and they've rehearsed it for thousands of years. Hmm. Maybe that's the way the Spirit works in song and in thought, is that it is music, and the words are musical or have musicality to them. I like to think so, because a lot of times in the old King James or in the old English or even in the Dewey Reims or in the Catholic Bible, a lot of scripture is written into the way that you would sing it, and it has a rhythm to it in the reading thereof. And for me, that's why I love King James or... When I look at a Catholic Bible, I love reading the Psalms in the Douay Rings because it's really be it's poetic, it's beautiful. But having said that, in that blessing that I was given, when I first got saved, almost all the songs that I was learning at the time were taken from Scripture and put into music. So most of my training came from my worship experiences. I feel sorry in some ways for the Christians today who only get topical worship songs that are very emotive and emotional and wrap up your feelings inside and get you, you know, really going there. But they're really not the Word of God in song. And it's too bad because I was spoiled. People think I know the Word of God like cover to cover. No, it just happens to be that almost all of my Christian upbringing was in song of almost all the scriptures. And then I began to think that, like John Michael Talbot, that you could sing all of the Bible from cover to cover. And I remember at one time he said that he was doing that. I don't know if he ever completed the project, but I do know that his music is a blessing. And for me, it's like, wow, awesome. You know, I love to listen to him. He is Catholic and he's a monk, but so what? <laughs> Some people have a problem with that. I don't. <laughs> God saves anyone, everywhere, any way he can, any which way he can. And he will do it every which way but loose. <laughs> so, in my grasp of this knowledge of the scriptures and growing in the grace thereof, and I have no idea what we're talking about today because I'm like, what in the world and where am I going with this music and the word of God? How do they fit together? Father, what are you going to tell people? What are you going to teach me? I found that, you know, a lot of times song was the means with which I was able to communicate my feelings in the scripture to God, and God would communicate back to me through the scriptures to me for my feelings, because that is what music can do. Music, like they say, music calms the savage beast or calms the soul. It is a, I believe, it is the communicative device of the soul, of the emotion. 
that it is not just the word. The word is the communicative device of the physical realm that our mental aspect relates itself to, which is the word, which is the physical aspect of it, meaning just the word, word. But then when you combine music and word to make song, I believe that delves into the soul. And it is in the dimension of the soul that that is the communicative device. And then in the spirit, I think there's something more, but we won't get into that because I can get pretty mystical in that area. And like I said, it's all my opinion, but boy, can I tell you where it came from. <laughs> Whoa! Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, man, I got some real interesting sources for some of the things that I hang on to and really believe in. So, I was spoiled, like I said, when I first was saved because I all of my religious upbringing was a lot of songs sang, you know, over and over again, and we used to sing them, you know, like campfire songs, and we know the scriptures by that, you know. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God, he that loveth God, knoweth not God, for God is love. And now people say that's a Sunday school song, and I go, what? And that was what we were singing as adults. <laughs> Now people can't even quote the scripture. Wow! I think there was something to be said for singing it. Maybe that's a hint. Maybe that's a word. Maybe that's a song. Maybe that's a direction. But in Tozer, you know, I know for myself, my emotions sometimes went the full gamut. I know that in my day, now I know it's not true today because I see so many Christians, I guess, have the ability to listen to all the secular music they've ever wanted to hear because now they can get on the internet and play with their soul and let it affect their emotions and bring up memories wrapped between the pages of my mind. Memories. Aren't we just going oh so blind? In other words, people right now have the ability to get into all that soulful music that they used to get into. And we as born again Christians in the Jesus movement had said, we got to walk away from all our secular music. And I burned my albums. I threw away all the secular music I had. Got it out of my house. Man, it was like, whoa. I can't deal with that. I'm dealing with God. I want to be focused in. I don't want to be focused out. So I had to zero in on what was taking me out of my fellowship with God. So I had to make my music fit my lifestyle. And no offense, but you know, a lot of lyrics, a lot of music, and a lot of junk from the world made me feel worldly. Man, I was kind of an emotional person, you know. I could just get into Neil Diamond and go way off the deep end. Give me a little wine and Neil Diamond and I'm gone. Ha ha. Or, you know, give me some of that rock and roll music. Any old way you abuse it. It's gonna really confuse you because it's gonna take and lose you. Oh, wait a minute. That's not the lyrics. Or is it? You see, a lot of times, I don't know what people are doing nowadays. And I don't know if they're really into Jesus like we are, or we should be. But I think you have to separate yourself from the world and its ways. Maybe you can listen to all that good old junky music. I mean, junk music. I mean, uh, you know, worldly music. But what are you programming your soul with? And why are you having problems with your emotions? You may find it's a little closer to home than you think. It might be right there on your iPod and in your ear. Because, no offense... But if you're sticking the world in your ear, like I said, you could stick it in your rear probably and find out the same effect because guess what? That's basically what's happening is that you're having kind of like uh, one of those experiences that is not pleasant and you're going to find out too late that it was not beneficial to you because you'll find out that if you stuck it in your ear, the world, you're going to find out that when you look inside, guess what? They found polyps. They found bad stuff. They found cancer. It's killing you. I think so. Once they look inside, they go, ooh, look in your soul. Oh, wow. No wonder you're having problems in emotions. No wonder you can't get along. No wonder you're arguing and fighting. You've got this emotional obsession with feelings. And I recommend, personally, now I used to get spoiled because I had prayed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I only went through seven because after a while it seemed to be repetitious and they weren't going back into the songs. But one through seven seemed to all have scriptures in them. So I was kind of spoiled. I had praise albums from Maranatha Music from one through seven. And man, I was like, Ooh. And I even quit going to worship services that quit playing music like that because they were doing it in Sunday school. And I'd rather go to Sunday school than listen to some up-and-coming rising Christian artist who's got to do a revised, reworked, re 
inspired version of something that they wanted to do. Now, don't get me wrong. Some music in the Christian industry I think is good, but I think a lot of it is fluff. You know, and I'm glad that you can express yourself in worship, but every man has a song. Every person has a life to sing. You, in your own version of it, should be using your words and your mouth and your inspiration to come up with your own song. And I do. I even have a rap song that I use for songs, for countdown songs. That's, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, and I reasoned as a child would. When I grew to be a man, I put away my plans, it's a put away my childish things. Three. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, and I reasoned as a child would. Actually, what I did was that, when I was in Alaska, I sat down and I said, you know, everybody should have a song, so I wrote 400 of them. <laughs> and I remember I was telling a pastor friend of mine, and I said, yeah, you know, I kind of, you know, sit down, I play, you know, and I said, you know, my fingers don't play so good anymore because I've got arthritis in it really bad, you know, even now it's kind of cramping up, I probably need to take some salt or something, potassium, but anyways, I sell my guitar, I still play every now and then. But I said, you know, I wrote 400 songs, and I know he thought I was insane, because, you know, he's a worship leader, and he's, you know, kind of into his shtick, you know, but I know he thought I was kidding. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding at all. I wrote 400 songs because I was so thrilled about being able to play the guitar, because it was such a miraculous experience. Someday I'll tell you the story behind that. But it was a miracle, because I couldn't play guitar for nothing. I couldn't, I went to guitar classes and couldn't play. It was like, down, down, up, up, down, 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 up, up, down, up, down. A, C, you know, and I still can't do bar chords because of my arthritis, but, you know, I was trying to do guitar and I couldn't do it. I couldn't pick for nothing. Then one day, guess what? I sat there for two hours straight because God just had me start picking and I was like, oh my God. I didn't want to look down at my fingers. I was so shocked that I was picking. And then my other fingers moved and I went, oh, wow. I must have played for days before I finally decided to put the guitar down. Okay, maybe it was a days, but it was at least four hours. When I put that guitar down, man, my fingers were worn out. It was an old Takamini, but boy, it was like, man, I had cramps, and I was scared that the next day I wouldn't be able to play because it was such a miraculous experience. But we'll tell you the whole story about that some other time. So anyways, long story short is that I believe that a lot of our issues that we face, we bring upon ourselves, and that's why we have Jesus. Because you see... A lot of times we can't figure out what's wrong and what's going on in our life. You know, like, well, you know, Lord, I was doing okay because, you know, I, I thought I had my life together and then suddenly I fell in love and now I don't know what to do, you know. I don't know why I'm in love, God, but you know what? I'm in love with my hot dogs. I'm in love with my Harley. I'm in love with my car. You know, I got to shine that thing and put some chrome on it, you know, and I got to lift it and I got to lower it and I got to... <laughs> I gotta lift it, I gotta lower it, I gotta polish it, I gotta make it so good that it looks like the God of that street. I mean, the, the car of that street. I mean, you know what I mean, God. It's not my idol. It's just a car. Really, Lord, it's just a car. Scratch it and see. I won't react. Hey, I'm a Southern California kid. Don't tell me about your car. I'm the guy that lived in his car <laughs> in order to be next to church. I am not into cars. God eliminated that one from me right away. As a matter of fact, I was so in love with going to church and in love with Jesus that I left my home in Norco, you know, because I just moved back in with my parents, you know, and I decided, you know what, I can't drive 35 miles or 40, 60 miles, I forget how far it was, probably about 60 miles or 70 miles, maybe even 80 miles, but it took two hours to get there. You know, so anyways, I can't drive two hours just to go to church for one service. I said, I want to go every day. Look at the look at the menu. Of course, I didn't know they were called bulletins. I thought they were menus, you know, because I came from a restaurant background. So I'd open up the church menu and I'd go, man, Mondays they're serving this. Tuesdays they're serving that. Thursdays, Wednesdays they're serving something every day of the week. So I wanted to go. So I said a prayer and I was there. <laughs> I had a Ford. 68, I think, Ford wagon. You know, one of those old beaters that has the one torsion bar goes across the back. If you break that, it flops back and forth sideways. You know, going, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, mine didn't break, but you know, <laughs> the car with the, tr the wagon was what it was. And I laid it down, you know, and I had my bed back there. And then, you know, I'd hide, you know, stuff over it so nobody knew I was living in it. Funny thing was, was that, you know, 
just recently with the economy when it changed, everybody was living in their car and man, I don't know why I was ashamed back then. People just caught up with me. I was ahead of my time. I was styling. So being along here hippie people that I was, I lived in my car headed down to Orange County and I used to get chased out of all these parks because cops would come up and knock on my window and tell me, you can't sleep here. You can't sleep here. Man, I got thrown out of almost every park in Orange County until finally I worked up enough nerve because I was so scared and so afraid and so nervous about all these other Christians because I didn't want them to mess up my relationship with God that I actually went to the little bulletin board that they had at Calvary and they said, roommates, you know, and I went, that's kind of a neat idea. I said, I wonder if I can afford it, you know, and I kind of looked and found three Christian roommates who were looking for one and I went and interviewed, <laughs> some interview, <laughs> yeah, come on in, you know. And I was like, well, well, and I grew from that because I had Christian roommates. But, and then I lived just, oh, I don't know, I think it was, I was on the bus line, so I thought that was cool too. But uh, I think I lived um, maybe, it was down Fountain Valley, so I wasn't far from Calgary. But, uh, I don't know, probably about 10 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that to get to church. So I went to church seven days a week. So I was thrilled, you know, it was exciting. But you know, it cost me something. It cost me giving up, living in and with my parents and family and stuff, you know, and leaving that behind to go somewhere to be closer to what I needed for my spiritual life. Sometimes we have to make those choices. We have to decide which way we will go and what it will cost us. Abraham had to leave his family behind, as God said to, but he compromised. He took his family part way. You see, Abraham was told, get you up out of Ur of the Chaldees and I will take you to a land that you do not know of and I will make you a father of all nations. But Abraham grabbed his father and took him with him as a good son would. And they went to, I think it was, ooh boy, I'm not going to look it up right now, but anyways, it was one of the cities that wasn't far away. You know, they'd gone on their journey just a little bit out. You know, maybe a couple days journey by camel. You know, maybe a week. I'm not sure, but um, it was just kind of like to the north. You know, and think of Ur. Let's see, Ur's here. They were kind of like they went north, and then they kind of went a little bit uh, west. So it was a little north and west. I can't remember the name of the town, but anyways, they went there, and then they stayed there, locked down. And they were there for a while until finally his father died. Well, when his father died, bingo, all of a sudden God's talking to him again, and bingo, they're heading west towards the land that God was going to give him. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do for the consequences, and sometimes you get entangled, and until you get untangled, you're going to have to deal with it. That's why I don't get into secular music, and I don't get into some things that other people can do. No, I don't want a Harley, and I don't want a house painter. No, I don't want to have myself entangled in all these things. I prefer to have myself able to be used by God as He chooses to use me. So, in a lot of ways, He asked me if I still got my backpack. What's the name of it? Sojourner. It's called, and it's made by Sojourner. <laughs> I got it at a Fred Meyer. <laughs> it was cheap. <laughs> still got it. <laughs> And I use it. <laughs> oh no. It's like my wife looks out the window, sees the wind blowing, and goes, Oh no, where's Michael going? <laughs> okay. We haven't gone quite like that anymore, but you know, since I met her, she knows what it's like. <laughs> so we moved quite a few times. And we haven't been married that long. I think we've been married, oh, I don't know. I always say, I don't know how long we've been married. Probably about five or ten years, you know. Okay, we're in our sixth. Seventh year of marriage. There we go. We've been married seven years. So, anyways, the point being is that it is so wonderful when you allow God to take you where He wants you to go. Because though the consequences, sometimes you have to pay for it, and you have to deal with some of the stupid things you've done, the reality is Jesus is still in heaven. Not just seated at the right hand of the Father, but whispering your name into his ear. He's talking to God on your behalf. He's acting as our high priest, doing those things that he wants the Father to do for us. So he's always kvetching and kvetching, well, okay, kvetching, so to speak, to the Father and saying, hey God, 
I want you to take care of, you know, Michael over there, because he's going to blow it. <laughs> yep, I sure am. I'm going to dive right in it. <laughs> wow, splash. I thought it was a pool. It was a mud puddle. Oh, well. Got a little splashed on. i got to get all cleaned up now. And that's kind of what God wants to do with you, is that He wants you to rest assured that sometimes you don't understand what you're going through. Sometimes you don't know why things aren't working out exactly the way you thought they would. You know, kosher. You thought that this Christian stuff was kosher and that it was going to go from, let's see, it says from glory to glory, so I believe in glory, 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 glory. You know, it's going to get better, 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 better. Well, you know, somewhere along the line when you start reading, you know, your Bible, uh, there's a book called James. <laughs> I had a pastor that used to teach James, and the first thing in James is, Count it all joy, and then you can read the rest. So go to James and check it out. <laughs> Ooh, you'll love it. He'll teach you what Christianity is really all about. So because we're discipling and we're learning and we're teaching and applying the scriptures that God has given to Tozer and his life, we have the plan of redemption that God has not abandoned man. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. From 1 Timothy 3.16. That is God. That is Jesus. For mankind, the earth has become the symbol of death and mortality. But in the very face of this, the Christian still knows for certain that God has not forgotten him. Whew. Thank God. <laughs> Man, who is made in the image of God, has not been forsaken. Make that a double. Man, God promised, has a plan to restore that which has been made in his image. Or God has a plan to restore man who is made in his image. Only that creature whom he called man did God make it his own image and likeness. No one else was made in the image and the likeness of God, except man. So when man failed and sinned and fell, God said, I will go down. I'll take care of it. That's my creation. I'm his backup. I'm going to do it. I've got it covered. I will make amends. I'll pay for it. It's my son, my image, my likeness. I'm coming after him. I'm going to do it. God came down to visit us in the form of a man, for in Christ Jesus we have the Incarnation. God manifested in the flesh. God himself came down to this earthly island of man's grief and assumed our loss, our debt, our problem, our issues, our struggles, our life, our will. Everything! And took upon himself our demerits, our problems, our issues, our trials, and our tribulations, and in so doing, redeemed us, purchased us back into himself, putting a deposit down on us. And he said, I got it covered. I'll pay. Take it out of my account. Jesus Christ, the King of glory, the everlasting Son of the Father, in his victory over sin and death, opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. All believers that believe in him. Beyond his death and resurrection and ascension, the present work of Jesus is twofold. It has to be an advocate above, him being our advocate, our lawyer, our person that's taking care and talking to the Father on our behalf, a risen Savior with high priestly office at the throne of God, and the ministry of preparing a place for his people in the house of his Father and our Father as well. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. That where my Father and I are, there you shall be too, for you are a co-heir with Jesus Christ, adopted unto the salvation that Jesus has provided for us. Cool. I like being adopted. Man, my natural father, I still don't know where he is. I'm a bastard. But I got adopted. Woohoo! Wow, imagine that. The whole world got adopted. That is what the Bible teaches. That is what the Christian church believes. 
it is the essence of the doctrines of the Christian church relating to atonement and salvation. Jesus is on your side. The part that you need to recognize is that because he's on your side, really, stick with what he wants you to do and don't go after what you think you want to do and you'll find that the price that you have to pay for all those things that you thought you really wanted to do really don't amount to a hill of beans when it comes to what's happening in heaven. And the reality is you can extend your life in such a way that God may take you someday to give you a vision as the skies part and you look out and it opens up right before your eyes and you see God seated at the right hand of the Father. Even as Stephen did. That you one day have such a miraculous experience that you can't even describe it and you're sitting there with your mouth hanging on the floor. If you're satisfied for anything less, that's religion. Because no offense, every born again Christian that I know of has some kind of personal religious experience that is like, wow. So until you get your wow experience, you might want to kind of shuffle off and slough off and kind of begin to step aside from all these things that kind of occupy your mind and your heart and your head and your attitude and your actions and your direction and put it back in the hands of God. Let Him make you into what He wants you to be. Maybe, you may be surprised at the end result, though sometimes the step, send the footsteps along the way seem like a long journey that way. When the reality is you're going that way. And he may take you the long way around. Just so you can get rid of all the other junk that you're carrying. Because one thing I learned about carrying my backpack. Man, if I had a long ways to go, I started chucking and chucking what I didn't want in that backpack. Because it gets heavy after you've walked a far ways. And once you start going uphill like this, you start switching back. And when you switch back up a few mountains or two, you know, because I've been living in Alaska before and... I've been hiking around Oregon trails like my brother-in-law taught me to, you know. When you realize that, you know, you have to carry that stuff, you don't want to carry what you don't have to. You only want to carry what you need. <laughs> and you know what I used to have in that backpack that I used to take everywhere with me? You won't believe it. The first thing that went in my backpack, everywhere I went, my strong concordance and my Bible. I took very few clothes, as my family will tell you. I took very few, never had any money, so I didn't take that. I took very few clothes. I might took a reindeer, maybe, you know, like a, I don't know, maybe a tarp or something, or a piece of plastic, you know, bag. But anyways, when I was hitchhiking, or when I was taking my backpack, you know, walking, man, I just threw a Bible in there and a strong accordance, and I was out the door, you know, to go help somebody share whatever it was that the Lord would have me to do. So, in life, the same thing is true. Just because you get blessed doesn't mean you want to get possessed by your blessing. You want to use those things to minister to others and keep as light a touch on this world as you can. Because believe it or not, this ain't your home. Homie, this ain't your world. Guess what? You've got a place reserved in heaven with your name on it. <laughs> and you can thank Jesus for that. <laughs>